Good afternoon and welcome to the ECB press conference. I'm joined here on stage by President Lagarde and by Vice President De Guindos. And my name is Wolfgang Preussel. As always, this is a hybrid press conference. So for the online participants, I would ask them to turn on their camera and their microphones if they wish to ask questions. And with that, I turn over to President Lagarde, please. Thank you very much and good afternoon. The Vice President and I welcome you to our press conference. The inflation outlook continues to be too high and for too long. In light of the ongoing high inflation pressures, the Governing Council today decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 25 basis points. Overall, the incoming information broadly supports the assessment of the medium-term inflation outlook that we formed at our previous meeting. Headline inflation has declined over recent months, but underlying price pressures remain strong. At the same time, our past rate increases are being transmitted forcefully to euro area financing and monetary conditions, with the lags and strength of transmission to the real economy remain uncertain. Our future decisions will ensure that the policy rates will be brought to levels sufficiently restrictive to achieve a timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target and will be kept at those levels for as long as necessary. We will continue to follow a data-dependent approach to determining the appropriate level and duration of restrictions. In particular, our policy rate decisions will continue to be based on our assessment of the inflation outlook in light of the incoming economic and financial data, the dynamics of underlying inflation, and the strength of monetary policy transmission. The key ECB interest rates remain our primary tool for setting the monetary policy stance. In parallel, we will keep reducing the Eurosystem's asset purchase program portfolio at a measured and predictable pace. In line with these principles, the Governing Council expects to discontinue the reinvestments under the APP as of July 2023. The decisions taken today are set out in a press release that is available on our website. And I will now outline in more details how we see the economy and inflation developing and will then explain our assessment of financial and monetary conditions. Looking at the economic activity, the euro area economy grew by 0.1% in the first quarter of 23, according to Eurostat preliminary flash estimate. Lower energy prices, the easing of supply bottlenecks, and fiscal policy support for firms and households have contributed to the resilience of the economy. At the same time, private domestic demand, especially consumption, is likely to have remained weak. Business and consumer confidence have recovered steadily in recent months, but remain weaker than before Russia's unjustified war against Ukraine and its people. We see a divergence across sectors of the economy. The manufacturing sector is working through a backlog of orders, but its prospects are worsening. The services sector is growing more strongly, especially owing to the reopening of the economy. Household incomes are benefiting from the strength of the labor market, with the unemployment rate falling to a new historical low of 6.5% in March. Employment has continued to grow, and total hours worked exceed pre-pandemic levels. At the same time, the average number of hours worked remains somewhat below its pre-pandemic level and its recovery has stalled since mid-2022. 
As the energy crisis fades, governments should roll back the related support measures promptly and in a concerted manner to avoid driving up medium-term inflationary pressures, which would call for a stronger monetary policy response. Fiscal policies should be oriented towards making our economy more productive and gradually bringing down high public debt. Policies to enhance the euro area's supply capacity, especially in the energy sector, can also help reduce price pressures in the medium term. In this regard, we welcome the publication of the European Commission's legislative proposals for the reform of the EU's economic governance framework, which should be concluded soon. Turning now to inflation. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, inflation was at 7% in April, after having dropped from 8.5% in February down to 6.9% in March. While base effects led to some increase in energy price inflation from zero point, minus 0.9% in March to plus 2.5% in April, the rate stands far below those recorded after the start of Russia's war against Ukraine. Food price inflation remains elevated. However, standing at 13.6% in April after 15.5% in March. Price pressures remain strong. Inflation, excluding energy and food, was 5.6% in April, having edged down slightly compared with March to return to its February level. Non-energy industrial goods inflation fell to 6.2% in April, from 6.6% in March, when it declined for the first time in several months. But services inflation increased to 5.2% in April, from 5.1% in March. Inflation is still being pushed up by the gradual pass-through of past energy cost increases and supply bottlenecks. In services especially, it is still being pushed higher also by pent-up demand from the reopening of the economy and by rising wages. The information available up to March suggests that indicators of underlying inflation remain high. Wage pressures have strengthened further as employees in the context of a robust labor market recoup some of the purchasing power they have lost as a result of high inflation. Moreover, in some sectors, firms have been able to increase their profit margins on the back of mismatches between supply and demand and the uncertainty created by high and volatile inflation. Although most measures of longer-term inflation expectations currently stand at around 2%, some indicators have edged up and warrant continued monitoring. Let us now look at our risk assessment. Renewed financial market tensions, if persistent, would pose a downside risk to the outlook for growth as they could tighten broader credit conditions more strongly than expected and dampen confidence. Russia's war against Ukraine also continues to be a significant downside risk to the economy. However, the recent reversal of past adverse supply shocks, if sustained, could spur confidence and support higher growth than currently expected. The continued resilience of the labor market by bolstering household confidence and spending could also lead to higher growth than anticipated. There are still significant upside risks to the inflation outlook. These include existing pipeline pressures that could send retail prices higher than expected in the near term. Moreover, Russia's war against Ukraine could again push up the costs of energy and food. A lasting rise in inflation expectations above our target 
or higher than anticipated increases in wages or profit margins could also drive inflation higher, including over the medium term. Recent negotiated wage agreements have added to the upside risks to inflation, especially if profit margins remain high. The downside risks include renewed financial market tensions, which could bring inflation down faster than projected, weaker demand due, for example, to a more marked slowing of bank lending or a stronger transmission of monetary policy, would also lead to lower price pressures than currently anticipated, especially over the medium term. So let's look at the financial and monetary conditions. The euro area banking sector has proved resilient in the face of the financial market tensions that arose ahead of our last meeting. Our policy rate increases are being transmitted strongly to risk-free interest rates and to the financing conditions for firms, households, and banks. For firms and households, loan growth has weakened owing to higher borrowing rates, tighter credit supply conditions, and lower demand. Our latest bank lending survey reported a tightening of overall credit standards, which was stronger than banks had expected in the previous round, and suggests that lending may weaken further. Weak lending has meant that money growth has also continued to decline. Summing up, the inflation outlook continues to be too high for too long. In light of the ongoing high inflation pressures, the Governing Council today decided to raise the three key ECB interest rates by 25 basis points. Overall, the incoming information broadly supports the assessment of the medium-term inflation outlook that we formed at our previous meeting. Headline inflation has declined over recent months, but underlying price pressures remain strong. At the same time, our past rate increases are being transmitted forcefully to euro area financing and monetary conditions, while the lag and strength of transmission to the real economy remain uncertain. Our future decisions will ensure that the policy rates will be brought to levels sufficiently restrictive to achieve a timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target and will be kept at those levels for as long as necessary. We will continue to follow a data-dependent approach to determining the appropriate level and duration of restriction. In particular, our policy rate decisions will continue to be based on our assessment of the inflation outlook in light of the incoming economic and financial data, the dynamics of underlying inflation, and the strength of monetary policy transmission. In any case, we stand ready to adjust all of our instruments within our mandate to ensure that inflation returns to our medium-term target and to preserve the smooth functioning of monetary policy transmission. We are now ready to take your questions. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the first question goes to Annette Weisbach from CNBC. Annette, please. Thank you very much. Uh, President Lagarde, I have, of course, two questions. My first question would be on um, the rationale behind the reduced pace in the interest rate hike of 25 basis points. So why did you come up with that? Um, and my second question goes to the US regional lender banking crisis, which isn't over yet. So um, how concerned are you about potential spillover effects to the euro area? Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. I will take the first, and uh, maybe I will ask my, my colleague and friend, Vice President Luis de Guindos, to address the, uh, the second one. So let me tell you a little bit about the mood in the, in the room of the Governing Council. Um, I would characterize the mood as determined. Uh, all governors uh, are determined to fight inflation, tame inflation, and return it to 2% medium term. And we all concluded, as you have seen, that the inflation outlook is too high and has been so for too long. 
I would say then that the mood was very focused, and yet it is an in-between projection governing council meeting. But we were extremely attentive to all data that was available to us. And obviously, uh, one case in point is the bank lending survey that uh, you all uh, received or saw uh, on Tuesday when it was published, and which contains a lot of intelligence and information about the intention and the comparison between the lending practices and standards with what was expected by the banks, and I'm happy to come back to that uh, later. But it explains, obviously, uh, the decision that we made uh, for this 25 basis point uh, increase. I think in terms of method, uh, we were method dependent in many ways, just as we are data dependent, because we have articulated the uh, reaction function of our monetary policy decisions with the three key elements of the inflation outlook informed by the financial and economic data, the underlying inflation, and the uh, strength of monetary policy transmission. So we checked all the data that we had against these three criteria. And as is always the case at the Governing Council meeting, there was a variety of views expressed. And I think that it's fair to say that everybody agreed that uh, increasing rate was necessary, that uh, second, we are not pausing, that's very clear. Third, we know that we have more ground to cover on the basis of the baseline that we had, which is still guiding us until we have our next projection exercise, and on the basis of the data that we have received in the course of the last few days and that we brought together during the meeting. So, I think the uh, ultimate balancing act, which received almost unanimous support, and that is reflected in the monetary policy statement in front of you, was really predicated on the methods, the data we received, the understanding that where we are is totally consistent with the baseline that we had for the outlook last time around. Remember, at the last March meeting, that's what I said. And second, that underlying inflation is still high. And third, informed by the bank lending survey and the data that we have concerning interest rates, which is a little bit outdated because it goes back to February, the transmission of our monetary policy is working, at least to the financing leg. And we're not yet certain about the next leg, which is transmission from banks to the real economy. So it's on the basis of all that that we made our decision. You know, now that we have you know, increased rates significantly and sometimes by very large increments, uh, I hope assessing um, not assessing, but establishing absolute credibility on our determination. It was sensible in view of what I have told you uh, to return to a more standard increment with the understanding that based on the information we have today, we have more ground to cover and we are not pausing. That's extremely clear. Good afternoon. Uh, turning to your second question, I think that we should start uh, by a consideration, if you look at uh, the characteristics of the, of the U.S. banks that are running into difficulties, I think that there are some common features. The first one is that they are medium-sized, regional. Uh, they share uh, a very concrete and very idiosyncratic uh, business model. And they are quite open to uh, interest rate risks. They are vulnerable to an increase in, in, in yields. And I think that uh, you know this model, this situation is not extrapolatable to the uh, to the to the European banking banking industry. Well, I will not repeat what we have said many times. The European banks are resilient. The level of capital, the level of liquidity, the quality of the of the liquid assets. But I think that uh, simultaneously we have to remember that an increase in interest rates in yields is positive for the European banks because uh, the increase in uh, in margins outweighs the potential losses that this uh, increase in yields could cause in uh, fixing on portfolios. 
But uh, I think that is quite clear that there is no, there is no space for complacency. Uh, one of the things that we have, uh, we have been, uh, all of us, surprised is about, uh, you know, how rapidly a bank run can take place and how rapidly uh, uh, a bank can be emptied. And I think that this is the combination of new factors. The first one is uh, digital banking, and the second one is social networks. And the combination of both have given, rise to an, have given rise to a new situation. And I think that supervisors and regulators, we have to, to bear in mind that uh, new framework, because we believe that uh, you know, this is going to be key in the near future. Thank you, President, Vice President. The next question goes to Francesco Canepa of Reuters. Francesco, please. Thank you, Francesco Canepa, Reuters. So my first question is about whether anyone at the meeting um, insisted on a, on a larger rate hike or on a clearer commitment to more hikes. Um, you just hinted at that by talking about ground to cover, but it wasn't quite as explicit as it was back in the winter when you were talking about steady pace and several rate hikes. Second question is about something you just said, which is again that you had more ground to cover. Would you say that we are still in the middle of the journey or towards the end in the home stretch? Thank you. I'm tempted to remind you of the Emerson quote. It's not so much the destination that matters, but the journey. And we are on a journey. OK? And we are not pausing. And under present circumstances, and based on what we have, which is the baseline of March, we know that we have more ground to cover. OK? And uh, there, is a, there is a clear reference to that, if you look carefully. And I know you have, because you do that very well, but in the second paragraph of the monetary policy statement, we explicitly refer to that by saying that our future decisions will ensure that the policy rates will be brought to levels sufficiently restrictive to achieve a timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target and will be kept at those levels for as long as necessary. We have covered a lot of ground in the last nine months, right? Moving from minus 50 basis points to plus 300 basis points. We are continuing this hiking process. As I said, this is a journey. We have not arrived yet. As to you know, the, uh, the exact amount of, you know, by how much do we increase rates? As I said in my introduction, uh, in the response to the first questions, there was a variety of views. Some governors, suggested that maybe 50 was appropriate. Um, others also believed that 25 was appropriate. I didn't hear anybody suggest that zero would be appropriate. So that confirms to you uh, that uh, this, is, this is a hiking journey that we are on. And, uh, and it, it, will, it will continue to be so. But at the end of the deliberations, and having had a chance to confront our views and to you know, answer the questions and, and to really sort of put everything in perspective, uh, there was a general, very strong consensus behind the decision that you have in front of you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question is for Jana, Jana Rando of um, Bloomberg News. Thank you. Um, morning. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> Um, I would like to invite you uh, to elaborate a little bit more on your definition of sufficiently restrictive. Um, the IMF had uh, a view um, the other day, um, seeing the terminal rate at 3.75%. Uh, a lot of economists uh, do that as well. Would that be something, given the inflation outlook we, we have at the moment, that, that would be in the ballpark of, of sufficiently restrictive? Um, the other question I have is um, that uh, at the last meeting, um, you had a little bit of a debate about uh, over-tightening and uh, having to reverse course. And I'm wondering whether that discussion um, continued this time and whether you would actually be worried that, that such a scenario um, might be interpreted as a policy mistake. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. The, um I, I don't have a magic number of what constitutes, open quote, um, sufficiently restrictive, end of quote. I think that the, the honest answer is we will know what that is when we get there. And we are 
in the process of moving in that direction. I think what's important is to understand you know, what, what, what it means to have restrictive uh, rates and to be in restrictive territory. And I think the best example is to see whether the rate decisions that we make, the rate increases that we decide, are actually having an impact on the economic actors. And when, when we look at the bank lending survey in particular, or when we look at the, uh, the interest rates and, and the pace at which it has increased in the last few months, it is obviously the fact that interest rate decisions that we made and the interest rates level where we are, are having an effect. Is it a sufficient effect yet? We don't know, because we are not seeing the transmission at this point in time into this, what I call the second leg of the economy, which is the, the real activity, which then has an impact on, on, on prices and then reduces inflation. So full cycle we're not seeing yet. We're seeing inflation coming down, don't get me wrong, because headline is coming down uh, as a result of energy prices having, having coming down significantly, as a result of the easing of, uh, of bottlenecks. But we're, we're not yet seeing the complete impact that we desire in order to arrive at the 2% medium term uh, that, that, that constitutes our targets. We, will, we, will, we are very attentive. We look at that. As you know, it's one of the three components that we look at, the inflation outlook. But we, we, uh, it is restrictive, no question about it. Is it sufficiently restrictive? Not yet. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Martin Arnold of the Financial Times. Martin, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, President Lagarde. I have two questions for you. The first one is on the decision to accelerate the pace of shrinking the bond portfolio at the ECB. Um, does that mean... Uh, now that you're stopping all reinvestments in the APP, does that mean that you plan to reduce the APP to zero eventually? Um, and the second question that I have is, was this decision part of a compromise deal uh, to uh, convince those arguing for a 50 basis point move to accept a, a 25 basis point move in return for accelerating the pace of shrinking your balance sheet? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Martin, for, the, uh, for this sort of double question um, on, on the same issue of the APP. Well, I would say, number one, we made the decision, but the decision specifically says we expect. So we expect to let um, the APP run off uh, as time goes by. And in answer to your question about do we go to zero, if we do, then it's going to take the next 15 years. So I don't think I'll be around for that. I know I won't, and I'm not sure that you will be around. But the ultimate uh, perspective is, is, is that one, uh, as we consider things uh, today. Um, you know, we've decided to, to expect the effectiveness of that decision as of July, saving a little bit of optionalities just in case, simply because we have seen that the partial reinvestment that we decided back in, uh, that has been effective since March, has actually run very smoothly and has been uh, well absorbed uh, by markets. So we don't see any, any point in, in not accelerating the move uh, because there are valid reasons for that. You know, lower the amount of excess liquidity, complements our policy rate uh, increases, reduce the side effect of a large balance sheet, all of that uh, completely justifies the fact that the APP is let to run off gradually over the course of time, which will be an average, um, an average 25 billion per month, uh, not reinvested, uh, roughly. But as I said, to, to, to run the whole APP program to zero, it will take 12 to 15 years, um, given the maturities of what we have. I would just reserve one thing, because we discussed it during the Governing Council, and it's not reflected in the... Uh, in the monetary policy statement. As you know, we have adopted a tilting approach to our investment policy of the APP, and in particular for the corporate bonds, which are the prime, uh, prime targets of that tilting in order to privilege uh, those corporates that have a good environmental footprint, that have a transition plan, and uh, that uh, disclose all the appropriate information about their plans. 
Now, of course, if we, if we go to full runoff, that tilting process is not going to be applicable because there will be nothing to tilt it off. Um, there will be no basis for that. So I think the, the jury is out as to how we can continue to deliver on our Paris Agreement compliant uh, investment reinvestment program without the reinvestment phase. And, and how do we, do we address that, which is something that we agreed we would, we would take into account and consider to see how we, we respond to that. Was it, was it a deal? No. <laughs> no, I, we, um, I think there was, there was a general view that that was the right, uh, the right move, completely sens you know, sensible, legitimate at this point in time, given the market absorption. I think some might have preferred to wait until um, the June meeting to announce it, given that it's effective as of the 1st of July. But, you know, with the principle of predictability that we had agreed in the first place, we thought it was just better off to just announce it with reserving a little optionality on the side. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Aude Kersulek of uh, BFM TV, French television. Good afternoon, Mrs. Lagarde. About the last banking uh, lending survey, so is there a target for uh, bank lending or limits in uh, credit tightening? How do you monitor these <coughs> indicators? And second question, you said recently in relation to uh, bank failures on the credit risk case that you really need to measure what comes out of this uh, financial event. So what are the indicators that uh, you're looking at? Would you say that there is a, a banking crisis? What's your view of uh, what's happening there in the banking system? Thank you. Yeah, on the, on the you know, we, we know of one and only one target, and this is our medium-term target, 2%. That, that's, that's what is, is riveting our attention. But of course, the bank lending survey that, that we receive on a, on a quarterly basis informs us about the, the tightening of credit to the economy. And it also informs us about what the banks assess will be or will not be the tightening. And it, it's quite a, a sophisticated uh, survey uh, which, which is really for uh, information, intelligence, anticipation of the, of the credit uh, tightening uh, now and the credit tightening going forward. It's also illustrative of the demand. And that's, that's a, an interesting point because in the BLS, the demand from corporates is really, really down. So that's, you know, learning that we take, which indicates that our interest rate policies is beginning to have an impact. Because when asked, the corporates say, and we had a corporate uh, survey uh, that was conducted, they say, it's the interest rates. It's not that you know, we don't want to invest, but the interest rates are, are pretty high. And that leads me to the restrictive territory or not. Yes, we are in restrictive territory, because if that is the response of corporates, then, then it shows that it's work. You know, on, on Credit Suisse, I think, I'll, I'll say a few words and then I'll, I'll ask my, my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. De Guindos, to also address that. But number one, it was addressed very swiftly. The Swiss authorities maybe did not have many choices. And uh, it was very specific and probably a long-lasting issue that was lingering and had been linger lingering for a long time. So I certainly would not draw the conclusion that the merger between UBS and Credit Suisse to be decided is an indication that there is a financial crisis, far from it. But we are learning. I think that we also learned the value of having rules and the ability we had to come out very quickly uh, on, on the pecking order of creditors uh, actually mattered a lot. And I think that we, we can also take a bit of learning from that. When, when Creditors, investors know exactly who is going to bear the brunt of um, outstanding liabilities and a situation of, of insolvency. It, it just helps. And we did that. I'm glad we did. Well, just to add uh, that on the, on, the, on the question about the indicators that we, we consider that we look at, well, we have uh, a range of indicators. Uh, for instance, you know, equity prices, bank bond spreads, the evolution of deposits. And uh, we have not seen, you know, the kind of situations that uh, happened in other, in other jurisdictions. So 
uh, we had, uh, let's say, uh, a sort of, uh, you know, increase of, of tensions after, you know, the events in the U.S. with uh, Silicon Valley and with uh, Credit Suisse. In other words, uh, you know, the situation has been quite, uh, quite calm. Huh? So we are continuously looking at uh, those indicators, but, uh, well, uh, you know, clearly, uh, now, you know, the conclusion is that the European uh, banking industry has been clearly outperforming the American one in terms of uh, detention, uh, you know, included in this kind of indicators and, uh, you know, the potential stress in financial markets. Thank you, Vice President, President. And uh, turning to our online participants now, um, I would like to give the floor to Francesco Nilfole of Milano Finanza. Francesco, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, President Lagarde, can you explain a little bit more how you reconcile with your data dependency with uh, uh, the, the pledge? What? Can with the ex pledge? Excuse, excuse us. Can you repeat? Because we, did, we missed a bit of your question. Okay. Can I explain uh, what? Can you ex explain uh, how you reconcile your data dependency with uh, uh, the pledge of uh, uh, doing more in the future? It can be a little bit uh, contradictory, like uh, forward guidance without a forward guidance. Maybe you explain. You can explain it a uh, little bit more. Secondly, on uh, core inflation, uh, no doubt it is important to monitor core inflation, but uh, the ECB's target, as you have said now, just now, is headline inflation at two percent in the medium term. So. Uh, how do you explain such a great emphasis on core inflation, also given, also considering that core inflation has not been a good leading indicator for headline inflation in the past? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, data dependency is not forward guidance. And I'll try to explain that for you uh, for a second. I'm not giving you the forward guidance that, come what may, or subject to, or until such time, we will do this or that. That, for me, would be forward guidance, okay? And we had it in the past, and it was very appropriate to have forward guidance as we were at the lower bound, and that was a tool that was very useful. What I'm telling you now is, given our baseline, the findings that we have, the data that we can analyze today, our judgment in the room is that we are not pausing, that applies to today, and based on what we see, we determine that we have more ground to cover. I'm not saying that in the abstract, I'm saying that with reference to the baseline of March, to what we are seeing in development, and I'm here saying we believe that we have more ground to cover. It is not state dependent, it is not time dependent, it is an, a judgment that we make today. So I hope I've been clear to try to explain to you how we can actually say that very firmly without giving forward guidance and being data dependent. Comes the June meeting, comes the July meeting, comes the September meeting and so on and so forth, we will look at the data and we will use the three criteria of our um, reaction function for monetary policy purposes, and we will make our decision on a meeting-by-meeting -meeting basis. So, you've also asked me another question about core. We had long discussions about core, and we actually had many more discussions on underlying inflation, because core is interesting. Core, core is easy to communicate. You take headline, the whole basket of everything that's in the index, you take out food, you take out anything having to do with energy, and you have core. But we want to go a little bit deeper into, into the, the, the index and the evolution that we see, and we have multiple measurements that you are familiar with, um, you know, the trim, the PCCI, the PCCI excluding energy, and so on and so forth. We look at all of those, and we try to understand from the evolution that we see what is the likelihood of inflation evolution? So, I'm not maybe addressing you core versus headline, but simply I'm saying that headline is the objective that we have, it's the target that we have, 
that we've agreed in our strategy review. It's also, it happens to be what matters to people. People see all prices increasing. And we're working for the people of Europe, okay? Core, easy to communicate, but maybe not as informative as we want it to be. So that leads us to dissect in far more details inflation. Thank you. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Christian Siedenbiedel of Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Christian, please. Yes, thank you. Madame Lagarde, I'm sure many people will be interested to know whether the worst of inflation is over for food. Do you have that impression? Thank you for that question, because it is, it is food prices that is hurting most. Uh, particularly the most vulnerable people. And we know that because the, in, in, the, in the basket of consumption, the most vulnerable spend a lot more on food than those who are well off. So we, we pay special attention, of course, to, uh, to food and, and the increase in prices. We have seen it go down, right? If you compare March and April numbers, so it is going down. But we have to be extremely attentive because there are multiple factors that apply to food prices, that apply to processed food prices. I think we have also um, flagged the fact that profit last year, in particular in 2022, have contributed uh, to inflation. This year, 23, what we have seen of 23, we see more wage increases contributing to inflation. We would hope that through a a good social contract, the, these drivers of inflation do not uh, activate each other in what I have called in other places a, a tit for tat. You know, I want more wages, I'm not going to give up on profits, and, and you, you are at, then at risk of, of something that is uh, much more difficult and would lead us to have to take more active measures in monetary policy. So I wish I could tell you of course, it will continue to go down, but I've obs I'm observing that it has gone down. There are other factors that will come into play. You know, clearly, climate change is something that will have an impact, probably on a sectoral basis, probably in relation to certain food items. Uh, what happens in Ukraine is also going to bring another uncertainty in the background of cereal price in particular. But commodity prices have gone down. That is, that is a fact. So, Hopefully, it, it will channel to the ultimate consumer. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question goes to Andres Stumpf of Expansion. Andres, please. Good afternoon, Madame Lagarde. Good afternoon. Uh, can the ECB continue hiking if the Fed stops? Is that uh, a baseline a scenario you are working on? And a uh, second question. Uh, do you have any estimates on how much tightening is uh, the QT and the TLTRO maturity adding to the monetary policy stance? Can you can perhaps phrase it in, in hiking or basis points of hikes? Thank you. Um, you know, I've heard the fiscal dependency, I've heard the finance dependency, I had not heard the Fed dependency. So the, the ECB is an independent central bank. You know, looks at what others do around the world from New Zealand, which has been an interesting innovator in the field of monetary policy, all the way to uh, the Fed and, 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 and others. And it's obvious that the US economy, in whichever way it, it evolves, has spillover effects around the world, given, of its, given its size, the depth of its financial markets. But you know, it, we, we have a target, we have a journey, we know as of today that we have more ground to cover, and whatever the decision of the Fed is in the next few weeks, months, we are going to be riveted to our objective, and we'll of course take into account variables. You know, the, the, the currency, for instance, has an impact. The, uh, the any spillovers will be taken into account, but we are not um, Fed dependent in, in 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 that respect. As to the the actual tightening impact um, that the APP runoff has. Uh, I, I don't want to, to commit a number, but it, it does not have a massive impact, suffice to say. Uh, but we, we can give you, you know, separately the exact amount that has been calculated. But it's not, it's not uh, material. Thank you. And the next question goes to Anna Carismo of the Finnish television, Ule. 
hello and thank you for the opportunity and nice to see you again. Nice we met in you. Lapland. <coughs> so, yeah, uh, you you have repeated that uh, the journey continues and uh, you are not pausing. Uh, there are many households in, in Finland, Lithuania, Spain, that uh, struggle with the much higher interest rates and have had to cut down on their spending. So uh, how do you take them into account when hiking the inter interest rates? And then a second one, what should they prepare themselves for? What can you say to them about the future? When can we see the policy rates uh, going down and maybe affecting also the 12-month uh, Euribor? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and it's nice to see you again in, in warmer circumstances. Um, so, of course, we are aware of these, uh, these households that have contracted uh, loans with floating rates, variable rates, whatever you call it. Uh, and from, from Finland to, uh, to Portugal, uh, from some of the Baltic countries to Spain, it is the case that some families are, are hurting because the reimbursements uh, that they have to honor have gone, have gone up as a result of the interest rate increases that we had to decide. This is unfortunately not something that we can you know, alleviate or, or attenuate because our, our task is price stability. Our task is to reduce inflation. And uh, the tools of choice that works in that respect is the interest rates. And we have to use that, that interest rate. Some countries are taking particular steps and measures, and uh, some financial institutions are also looking at offering moratorium or, or delay. And I think that the best we can do is to really tame inflation in a timely manner, meaning as fast as we can, in order to then facilitate a return to, uh, to different interest rates that would not be as high in the future. And I'm not here making any commitment to cut at any point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Lagarde. And the next question goes to Shogo Akagawa of uh, Nikkei, Japanese Newswire, here in the middle. Thank you. Um, you will travel next week to Japan for G7 meeting. What kind, what kind of topics do you want to bring uh, at this upcoming meeting from European point of view? Thank you. Thank you for giving us that, that angle from uh, from from the East, um, you know, I would hope that together with my European colleagues, uh, we can, uh, one, learn from colleagues, particularly Japan, which is uh, which has just now, uh, which is moving into a new direction with a new governor. So anything that will be the Japanese monetary policy going forward and any understanding that we have of their strategy review, which he has announced, uh, will be of interest. And I would be very happy to share with him the learnings from our strategy review, which I had started when I took the job. I would also hope that we can explain uh, to colleagues from Canada, Japan, and the United States that the Europeans together uh, are going to continue to demonstrate resilience, capacity to operate together, uh, and I would hope that in that respect, something that we say in the statement here will resonate, which is to agree on the fiscal governance in short order, so that in addition to having a monetary policy that is common to 20 countries, we also have a fiscal framework which gives governance to the 27 member states, and that fiscal policies that are determined by member states are also focused on value for money, for lack of a better word. In other words, putting in place the right reforms, focusing the spending where it is going to increase uh, the, um, the competitiveness and, and the efficiency of the economy, which is something that is absolutely indispensable in order to have this social contract, which is often associated with Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And the next question goes to Isabella Bufaki of Il Sole 24 Ore. Isabella, please. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. If I may go back to a quantitative tightening, just to understand whether there is more ground to cover, 
on QT or whether with this um, end of our investments on APP, this is the end of QT. Uh, there, there could be more to be done with PEP, for example, starting on pandemic uh, or selling bonds to make it even quicker. So this also helps to understand how important is QT as a restrictive tool monetary mm. policy. And my second question, if I may, is, is on Teltros, because even if the uh, European banking system is solid and resilient, and the banking crisis uh, from the US uh, could be uh, over, we hope, still uh, Teltros are going to end in an odd moment. And uh, are you concerned or are you confident mm. the banks can give back 500 billion in June and get, get away with it? Four hundred and about, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on, on QT, uh, let me be very clear. QT is the decision that we expect to implement as of the 1st of July concerns APP reinvestment only and nothing else. We have forward guidance on, uh, on PEP reimbursement, nothing until 24. And uh, you will find, I think, in the... Uh, in the annex to my statement, reference to the PEP and to the principle of flexibility, which we believe is a, an important um, uh, key aspect of, of PEP going forward. So those tools are intact. We're not planning on uh, not reinvesting anything that uh, comes for redemption under the, under the PEP agreement. On the, um, on Teltro, well, Teltro, you know, there is no surprise about Teltro. Huh? Um, if anything, we have managed to, uh, to offer the possibility for, for banks to accelerate and anticipate the reimbursement, which I think has avoided a cliff effect that we would have had uh, in, in the, you know, over a trillion dollars would have become outstanding in, in June. Thanks to the accelerated reimbursement, we are now down to 477. I'm checking the numbers because I want to, I want to be clear on that. So it's not a surprise. It, it's, a, it's a come due date and reimbursements are due. And I'm, I know that banks have prepared for it uh, and, and that there is a lot of liquidity out there to continue to prepare. Having said that, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the facilities that we have that are standing facilities uh, liquidity windows that are available, full allotment and, and, and rates that are well known to, to all, would become used, usable, they are usable, and, but would be used again, because that's perfectly normal uh, job of a central bank to actually provide liquidity. You know, we have weekly, we have the LTRO, three months, uh, full allotment on, on, all, on all those uh, liquidity facilities. And if, if anything was to happen, we have demonstrated in the past that we can be inventive. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our press conference today. Um, so I wish you all the best. We have the next press, press conference on 15th of June. And until then, all the best and a good afternoon. Thank you.